This is Tracy. Welcome everyone to our downsizing series. I'm so happy that everybody has joined us today. Um, we have Amy Berent here. She's the owner of A Matter of Brilliance and, and she'll be introduced in a minute or two. I just want to make mention on the emails that I sent out to everybody, I encouraged everyone if they have a necklace or a ring or whatever to keep it next to you and at, at the questions and answers, you can ask questions. Just before this program, I met with Amy and with Ellen on, whoop, on, on uh, Zoom, and Amy has advised us not to do that. And the reason is we will have a question and answer period following the program. And I'm asking everyone, if you ask a question about, I have a pearl necklace or whatever, I would like you to send it to me, to Tracy. Don't send it to everyone. We are trying to make sure that security wise, not everybody knows your personal business, what's in your house. So that's, so remember, if you're sending a question about anything like that, send it to me. And when I ask Amy the question, I'm not gonna say your name. I'm just going to say, a woman asked, she has this necklace, et cetera, et cetera. So we are not going to have you show it. And I apologize for that. It was my mistake. I got very excited about the jewelry, but we want to protect everyone. And if someone's on Zoom and he, they're there looking, oh, Sally you know, Jones has this necklace. I don't want somebody bothering you about it and that type of thing. We're trying to maintain privacy. So, so please understand. Okay, so after the presentation and the questions and answers in the chat, the chat goes to Tracy. So I want to first uh, welcome um, Ellen Dudley. She's the sponsor of this series and she will say a few words and then she will welcome Amy Barron. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you could all be here. And I wanted to say I'm Ellen Dudley. I work with Keller Williams Realty out of Newton Center and I would love to be your resource if I can help in any way if you have any questions about downsizing I hope many of you have been here this is our fourth week of this series it's been a lot of fun and um, I will again put my my contact information in the chat and if anybody needs anything ever please feel free to reach out I love to be a resource whether you're planning to downsize or whether you're planning to stay in your home I have a lot of connections in the senior uh, real estate industry. And today I am so happy to welcome Amy Barrent. Amy is the owner of A Matter of Brilliance. She has over 25 years of experience in the jewelry trade. She received her graduate gemologist in, in residence diploma from the Gemological Institute of America in Santa Monica, California. And she is a member of the National Association of Jewelry Appraisers. Amy is going to help us investigate if your jewelry is valuable or not. So thank you for being here, Amy, and take it away. Well, thank you. Let me get into um, sharing my screen. And uh, we're going to go have some fun this afternoon. And here we go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. This has been so much fun for me preparing for all of this. Um, for those of you that have a jewelry box, have you can tell a story for everything that's in your jewelry box. You know where every piece has come from. You know when a piece was given to you by your mother, by your grandmother, what you bought on vacation. Um, so we're just going to kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive to identify what you have and um, have some fun with that. If you're wondering how I got into doing this, I am an independent jewelry appraiser. I am a graduate gemologist. I grew up in a jewelry family. Um, my grandfather and father had a jewelry store in New York and I had no intention of staying in New York. <laughs> so I came to Boston and found myself working for a very large jewelry manufacturer. They were the largest in the North America at the time. And um, I got to see the jewelry world from a totally different perspective. So with that, I met somebody and they said, you know, you might make a great gemologist. 
And I went, really, you want, you want me to go back to school? Um, but I, I looked into it. I decided to do the residency program in Santa Monica, California, because let's face it, I've gone through a winter in New York. I thought a winter in California sounded much better. Um, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. So from there, I have worked with national companies, big, small mom and pops. Um, I've been a diamond buyer, a color stone buyer. Um, I work with uh, estate dealers. I work for with large auction houses. My contacts are international at this stage. Um, and one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I manage a repair shop. So when you when I look at a piece of your jewelry, you get all of my perspective. You get my, what is this made of? How is it made? What condition is it in? And we go from there. So I'm all about education. You should know more about your piece of jewelry than anybody else. One other little thing, you may have seen this little show. It's called the Antiques Roadshow. Yes, I did. I did work on the Antiques Roadshow. So that was a lot of fun. I get to do a lot of really fun things in what I do. Oh, you want to know what I do. I do insurance appraisals. I do estate appraisals. If somebody is looking to get their estate, their affairs in order, and you need to put a trust together, um, I'm somebody that you want to contact for your jewelry valuable things. I also do a catalog. Catalogs are a, a less detailed document, but my clients are finding a lot of uses for them. It's a brief um, document. It's a picture. It's a description and it's a value and it does in a list form. So it'll go from five items to 500 items, depending on what you have. And um, if somebody's going into a nursing home, if somebody is uh, moving or going overseas, it's good to have a list of what you have. Um, and then a lot of people just will inherit things and they don't know what they have. So they'll go, I've got this box of jewelry from my grandmother. What in here is valuable? So we'll go verbally go through it and how much is it worth? Um, that's, that's what a lot of people start with. And then if you need advice on how to um, sell your jewelry or silver or gold, I'm a good resource. Um, I do not buy and sell, but uh, I, can, I can definitely point you in the right direction. What makes my, what I do a little bit different is home appointments are available, especially now during COVID, and all my work is done right in front of you. So you don't have to worry about, is somebody going to misplace something? Did something get missing? No, it's all done right in front of you. So I hope that makes everybody feel a little bit more comfortable about the process. Now we're going to start in what I do. What do I look for? Um, there's a lot of different clues in your jewelry. I kind of consider myself the jewelry whisperer because jewelry will talk to me. It will tell me how it's made. It will tell me what condition it's in. And um, we will go from there. And um, sometimes these conditions are correctable and sometimes these conditions are not correctable. Um, but I will give you every option that you have. Um, so let's start with what a lot of people have in their jewelry are, are diamonds. And you know, a diamond is forever. And a diamond represents love. But what exactly goes into the value of a diamond? Um, I'm sure you've heard about the four C's. And the first one is carat, meaning what size is it? So this gives you a, a brief representation. They, um, It's not equal increments. <laughs> I wish it was, but it's not. Um, but it's a weight of measure. And it. It, it can be broken down into one carat equals 100 points. So you think of it kind of like there are 100 pennies in a dollar and you kind of go from there. Um, the, the larger the stones get, the more valuable they get. So people who come to me with a, a ring with a spray of small stones, as opposed to a, a ring that's got one very large stones, they're valued very differently. So that's why the carrot weight will, will come into play when you have something like that. Then people talk about the color. And I think color is one of the most endearing, fascinating things about a diamond. Um, I use the GIA scale, which is the Gemological Institute of America, and they start their scale at D, as in David. Um, I think that means just in case there's anything more transparent out there, they're going to leave a little wiggle room. But here's a clue about diamonds. Your, your untrained eye 
you look at this diamond ring every day. You are not going to see color in it until you hold it next to another diamond. That's how you compare color. Um, and another little sidebar about color in diamonds. Diamonds come in every color under the rainbow. There, um, there are red diamonds and green diamonds and yellow diamonds. Um, what a lot of people aren't aware of, unless you've actually seen it, is the Hope Diamond is a vivid blue and it's about the size of an egg and it is spectacular. So um, diamonds aren't just clear. They come in all different colors and all different shades. Um, and the way I grade them is I grade them with master stones. And those are what, what you compare everything else to. So that kind of is how I do that. When we talk about clarity, this is where, this is where there are things that your eye can see and there are things that your eye can't see. Um, clarity is based on the identifying marks. Think of it as a fingerprint. These marks aren't gonna change. If you've got marks that change or move, we got a problem because they're not supposed to change and move. So if you know that your, your ring has always had this little mark off to the side and you take it to a jeweler and you get a ring back and it's got a lot of black marks in it, that's not your diamond. You need to know what the identifying marks are. You need to know the fingerprint of your ring. That's why getting it graded is important. I do this with a 10 power loop. I bring it to my eye or I use my microscope. And um, you probably, again, won't start seeing inclusions um, with the naked eye until somewhere around, I don't know, can, you, can, I, can I get my little pointer? Whoops, whoops, what did I do? Um, until we're somewhere into the included range. The clarity grade starts at flawless and internally flawless. It goes to very, very slightly included, one and two. It then goes to very slightly included, one and two. It goes to slightly included, one and two. And then it goes to included. And by the time we get down to I two and three, we're talking a different kind of diamond at that point. So basically, you don't really start seeing inclusions until it's graded down in here. Um, and then it just depends on what your budget is and what your stone is to where it falls in the other in the other clarity grades. And then I think one of my most favorite things, my most favorite C is the cut. Because what a diamond does better than anything else, why we talk about diamonds, why we're always intrigued by diamonds is what a diamond can do. And what a diamond does better than anything else is it returns light back to your eye. That's it, it's plain and simple. Diamonds return light back. Now, if a diamond is well cut, like a round stone, you get a lot more of that fire and scintillation. Um, that's the sparkle. That's the, when you say, oh my God, I just, I just saw a, a flash of a blue and a flash of red and a flash of green. That's a well-cut stone. And then you've got the different shapes of the well-cut stones. You've got your rounds, which is an, an equal circumference. You've got a marquee, which is a point on either side. You've got a heart shape. You've got, this down here is an emerald cut. Um, an emerald cut is cut differently than the facet arrangements on, on other types of stones. If you think of an emerald cut as in like the edges of a beveled mirror, they're long facets. They're lo so they stretch the light out. So you get long waves of light flashing back at you as opposed to the, the firework effect that you get with the other ones. So that's why I kind of like cut the best because it really, it really can show off a diamond to what it does better than anything else. And then I always like to show this. These are people who like diamonds. <laughs> Never hurts to, to show that diamonds are a girl's best friend. Um, what I usually do at this point, um, I usually do a little quiz right about now and see if anybody knows what this diamond is and why this is important. But I'm not gonna hold you to a quiz at the moment. I'm gonna tell you. This is the Burton Taylor diamond. This is the diamond ring that Richard Burton gave to Elizabeth Taylor. Now, why is this important? Because after Elizabeth Taylor's death, they auctioned off her jewelry. She was a major jewelry collector. She loved jewelry. This one holds 
a lot of emotional value to it. So when this one came up for auction, let me show you what happened. Her 33 carat Asher cut diamond ring, they thought would sell between 2.5 million to 3.5 million. It went for almost 9 million. What that did, <coughs> excuse me, in the jewelry industry, it sent the price of Asher cut diamonds through the roof. Overnight, the price of Asher cut diamonds changed. So what does that mean? I had to contact all of my clients that had Asher cut diamonds and tell them we needed to reevaluate their, their um, appraisals because the, the diamond prices have changed that dramatically. So yeah, that's what something like this can do. So it was, that was kind of a fun period of time. And then just to watch the jewelry that she had, it was just amazing, absolutely amazing. So one of the other things that I look for is I look for the markings, I look for the hallmarks and they can tell me a lot of things about a piece of jewelry. Um, this piece here, it's a piece from Cartier. It's a Cartier Trinity ring. It's rose gold, yellow gold, and white gold, and it's stamped Cartier. There's other stamps on the inside, but that's one of the things that you're looking for. Here is a Tiffany and Company ring. This is stamped by Tiffany and Company. It has a lot of their logos. It also has a stamp 750. It's stamped there, and it's stamped there. 750 is telling me the purity of the gold that they're using. 750 is also, if you know how to decipher these numbers, is a European marking. So I know that this piece was made in Europe. Then we've got a, a stamping like this. It says 14K. I have a stamping like this, which is 18K. 18 karat gold, 14 karat gold. That tells me what purity the gold is and what, what it is I'm looking for along with the other marks. Now, I also put something else on this page. I've got, I've got a clasp here. You can see 14K over here, but in front of the 14K, it says 120th 14K. That's gold filled. They're trying to trick you with this. I know, what a surprise. Oh my God. Um, yeah, that's gold filled. And if you don't know what the markings mean, E you shouldn't be paying that much money for a gold filled piece of jewelry. At least not what you would be paying for a full 14 karat gold piece of jewelry. So just kind of give you some idea of some of the marks that I look for because this will affect what your jewelry is worth. When I talk about carrots and percentage, they're carrots with a K and pure gold, 100% gold, is what we call 24 karat gold. That's 24 parts pure gold. Let me tell you, you're not gonna see a lot of that on the marketplace because pure gold is very soft. In its natural state, you can, you can dent it with your fingernail. I'm trying to get my fingernail in the picture here. You can dent it with your fingernail. It is, it is not durable for jewelry. So that's why you don't see a lot of 24 karat out on the marketplace. Um, then you've got 18 karat, which is 75% gold. And you've got 14 karat, which is a little over 58% gold. These will tell you how much percentage that is real gold. And the other percentage is made up by alloys. And alloys make it stronger and make it more durable for you to be able to wear it. That's why we need to know. It's called an assaying. And in the olden days, shall we say, or the, the older European assaying offices. They had very specific stamps for what town they were in, what purity the metal was, and who made it. So these markings are all very important. So I love looking for markings and I get very disappointed if a jeweler has removed a marking due to a sizing issue or a damage issue or what that shouldn't ever happen but sometimes it does, it happens. I'm not happy, but it happens. Um, but talking about all of the different alloys, alloys can change the color of gold. I'm sure you've all seen yellow gold. 
and white gold and rose gold. Let me give you a little, a little fun fact. During the war efforts, they needed nickel to go into the machinery. So there was a scarcity of nickel. So jewelers started mixing copper in with the gold and then you would get rose gold. So I can tell when things are from the 40s um, because they are tend to be a lot more rose, rosy, pinky in color. And that helps me also identify the time period and, and, and what we've got going forward. So those are kind of kind of fun things to know about gold. And look who's wearing gold. Who doesn't love a Mr. T starter set with all of our famous people? They love wearing gold. Gold is a very naturally enhancing, fun sort of thing. So that's always, always fun to see who's wearing gold. Pearls, I love them. Um, we're having a slight resurgence in pearls at the moment. I hope it really catches on. And I hope pearl, pearls and pearl jewelry really get the, the notice and that they deserve. They go, these things go in cycles. So sometimes they're very popular in fashion and sometimes they're not. Um, I'm hoping that they're starting to get an uptick right now. So I don't know how much of you know the history of pearls. In 1910, a gentleman by the name of Mikimoto started cultivating pearls. He started man fingering around with pearls, just kind of playing around with them. And before then, before 19, say 1900, 1800s, before all of that, there the only pearls that the kings, the maharajas, the queens, everybody had were natural pearls, meaning he uh, opened up an oyster and you got what you got. And sometimes it was it was good and sometimes it wasn't. Um, so it was extremely, they were more expensive than diamonds. So there is a whole love of pearls because pearls are an organic gemstone. If you really think about it, it comes from a living creature. And that's kind of interesting. And what happens is absolutely amazing. What makes a pearl a pearl is what we call a nacre. And the nacre is the layers that the oyster secrete over the irritant. And that's what gives it its glow. And the glow is the luster. And there are lusters that are almost mirror-like. And you can just look into them and get lost for days into the luster. And then more or less, it's the size. Because what are we dealing with here? We go from very, very small to very, very big. So um, it depends on the oyster. It depends on where it's coming from. And, uh, and at the, pro the problem right now is that we're having is environmental issues with the pearling industry. You have got global warming. You've got oceans getting warmer than they're, they're supposed to be, and the oysters are dying right there in the farms. You've got bacteria happening, and those are destroying pearl farms. You've got um, typhoons, which happen in the South Seas. Those are the, what they call hurricanes. Um, if it hits a pearl farm, it can, it can rack up the water pretty hard and, and knock these pearls around and knock out a whole crop, a whole, a whole thing of, of, of pearls. So those are pretty much everything from, they really became popular, I'd say 1940, the cultured pearls. From basically from the 30s, 40s on till today, most everything that you see is a cultured pearl. I'm not saying everything is, but most everything is. And I'm gonna give you another fun fact about that is if you think about the timing, the 1940s were a lot of GIs went over to the Orient um, during World War II and they had all of these cultured pearls and they wanted to get their, their mothers, their wives, their girlfriends, their sisters, their sweethearts, whomever, a pearl necklace. So all of these pearl necklaces started coming back to the States. And then you've got Donna Reed on TV wearing a pearl necklace doing housework, which I never really understood, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, here is the problem. Let's go back to the pearls being a organic gemstone. 
They are very, very delicate. They do not like any kind of chemicals, meaning perfume, hairspray, body lotion, soap. And if you think about it, that's all the women in the 40s and 50s did. Gorgeous pearls have been unfortunately damaged and you, you can't reverse that kind of damage. Um, so they need, to, they need extra care. They need very soft environments to lay in. Um, they need to be wiped down. They need the, the, um, they're strong on silk with knots in between each pearl to protect the pearl from rubbing against each other. So over time, the silk will stretch, the knots will, will wear, and you need to get them restrung. You need to get them cleaned and restrung by somebody who knows what they're doing. So that's very important. Just to give you an idea, natural pearls versus cultured pearls. In my practice, I'm running at about 50-50. Someone will bring in a strand of pearls and from what they are able to put together, the lineage, we think it's, it's old enough that it might be a natural strand. Um, I look for certain, certain identify, identifying marks, um, shapes, um, to see if, if that will give me any clue as to natural versus um, cultured, but really if I'm limited in what I can see and what I can do. So the only way to definitively tell is to have them sent off to a reputable lab like the Gemological Institute of America in New York and have them, there's a series of tests that they do. Honestly, it's, it's in the form of an x-ray and they see what is the nucleus. If it's, a, if it's a bead, then it's a cultured pearl. If it looks like it's a, a, a grain of sand, it's probably a natural pearl. Um, I'm running about 50-50 so far with my, with my hunches and my clients who have sent them off. So a strand of natural pearls are usually graduated, meaning that they're smaller in the back and they go larger towards the center. Um, they're running at auction, they're selling between 20 to $30,000 for a natural strand with papers. Cultured pearls, you can probably buy a nice strand of cultured pearls, three to $5,000. There's a big difference. So you need to know what you have and you need to know how it's valued. So. If you have any questions, come talk to me. We'll see if we can figure it out. And these are some of my favorite people wearing pearls. And I know, I think they're some of your favorites too. Another fun thing that you have in your jewelry box are watches. So I'm hoping that we are in a world where watches still matter. Um, when I, when I need to go to my bank and I know the, the bank manager very well and we need to go to my safety deposit box because you have to timestamp those things. <clears throat> they don't usually wear a watch to tell me what time it is. They usually pull out their cell phone. <laughs> so watches are starting to become a very interesting commodity. Um, depends what your watch is, what the mechanics of your watch is and what condition your watch is. So on the left, we have, we have a Timex watch with a Spidel flex, flex strap. And this watch could probably retail new for about $25. It has a quartz movement, which is the kind that you change the battery on and away you go. Then over here, we've got a solid 18 karat gold Rolex watch. Last time I checked, these were around $15,000. So you need to know what your watch is. This is a mechanical movement. Um, and there's a lot, and there's a name that goes along with it and that brings along the prestige. You need to know what you've got and you need to know what condition. Is it in running order? Do the hands move? Does it need to be serviced? There's a lot of questions that we need to ask about watches. 
if you've got a watch like this, you can't just have anybody open up the watch and service it because you're going to have a problem. Um, when I get a watch like this, you have two choices. I can do a verbal assessment of your watch, or if we need to have the, the back removed and I need to verify the movement, I need to take it to a watchmaker who has the Rolex authority, who has the Rolex tools and can do this without damaging your watch. And that's an additional cost. So the choice is always up to you to find out what it is you have and what it's valued at. Watches, they're very exciting. Um, just something that because of our area here, Waltham was the head of watchmaking for the longest time. Waltham watches are, are world, world renowned. They know about Waltham watches across the world. There are a lot of pocket watches that come into my office, a lot. So I have, I have a few things that I have to talk to you about pocket watches for. What condition is it in? We've got this sweet thing over here that unfortunately, it's not in the best condition. Unfortunately, it's hit the floor. The porcelain dial has cracked. Probably the glass crystal has cracked. If not missing, the hands are broken, dented. We got issues. We got a lot of issues. Um, what condition your pocket watch is in is gonna depend on the value. I understand for a lot of people, these have got a great deal of sentimental value. It was my grandfather's watch. I understand. So then you have to make a decision. Is it worth repairing? Because let me tell you, a lot of these replacement parts no longer exist. The watchmakers who know how to, to take these watches apart, clean them and put them back together are getting older and older. There are very few young people going into watchmaking these days. So you need two things if you wanna get one of these repaired. You need to have a lot of time to wait and you're gonna need a lot of money to pay for it. So those are decisions that you need to make because it's not easy. Um, what we're looking for is what is the, if you're just like, hey, so if you wanna honor a family member, there are things, um, uh, glass towers you can put on your desk and you can hang the pocket watch there at, or on a mantle. And that's a lovely way to honor them. Um, for people who are looking to just see if it has any value at all, condition is, is the number one concern. The second thing is what is it made out of? Is that a 14 karat gold case or is that a gold filled case? The difference can be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So we need to find out what your pocket watch is made of, what condition it's in and what you wanna do with it. So those are some of the questions to think about when, you, when you've got a pocket watch. Um, one of my favorite things is to work with sterling silver because the workmanship on sterling silver is exquisite because most of it is, has been handmade. It's hand worked, it's hand done. Um, a couple of tricks of the trade, I'm gonna share with you things to look for and things to know. When you've got a candlestick, understand the majority of candlesticks are weighted here at the bottom, which means it's probably got a cement block in it. I know, what a surprise, who would have known? That's why they're so heavy. That's why they're a blunt instrument. Um, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, those candelabras that are um, got three or four arms sticking out from them. Understand those probably are also weighted and they have steel uh, rods in the arms. So that so it's not pure sterling silver that makes that heavy candlestick. But it's still sterling silver and it's still good. Then you've got things like coffee and teapots, servers, and sterling silver flatware. Let me show you on some of the things to look for in sterling silver flatware. What you're looking for is the word sterling right there. Turn the fork over, turn the spoon over, because I want to see what's on the other side. I want to see what the markings are. I want to see the word sterling. I want to see the word sterling right here. 
I want to see the markings that are on these these places. This will tell us a great deal as to who made it, maybe where it was made, and what it's made of. When we've got jewelry and and sterling, I'm looking for the words. I'm looking for the numbers nine two five, and I'm looking for the word sterling. I'm looking for the word sterling. If you ever turn over one of your spoons or your serving pieces, a little bowl or a dish, and you see the letters EP or you see the letters EPNS, that stands for electroplated, electroplated nickel silver, which means it's plated silver. And I will tell you, plated silver though it looks very much like the sterling, is very different. And one of the tricks of the trade, it's very heavy. Sterling silver is relatively light, electroplated, silver plated, very heavy because it's got a base metal in there, be it a brass or a, a pewter or steel or whatever, it's very heavy. And it's usually an item that gets a lot of work, like your platters. But we still have silver platters. You never know. Um, one of the other markings is, um, I, hope, I hope you can see this in right on the back. It says silver plated. Right there, silver plated. So turn them over, look for the markings. Um, I have people who take pictures of these markings and send them to me and ask me my opinion. I'm happy to tell you what I think or if it needs more investigation. But these are the things that you should be looking for. How many of you have one of these? It's a box filled with coins. You'd empty your pockets, you drop them in a box, you drop them in a jar, you drop them in a can, and then you forgot about them. It was under the bed in the back of a closet. So many of my clients come out with one of these. Does this have any value? I'm gonna show you a little trick. <sighs> For coins, the United States minted silver in the coins until 1964. Anything before 1964, probably got a good amount of silver in it. From 1965 to 1970, it was 40% silver. And this is silver dollars, silver half dollars, silver quarters, silver dimes. And just so you're aware, because I get asked all the time, the nickels are made from nickel. So no, there's no silver in a nickel. And yes, there are there are gold coins and those are those are the fun ones to come across. It's all fun, but these are the things that you should look for. If you've got a box, if you've got a box like this, understand this is what we call circulated coins, meaning they were out in circulation, they were in your pocket, they're a little banged up, they're a little ding, they're a little tarnished. Don't try to clean them. Do not try to clean them. Just leave them be and let's sort them out and let's figure out what you've got. If you ever come across the coins that are in what I call those hermetically sealed little containers, you know, little plastic shields, or you can see, that's a different animal and that's a different conversation. But these sort of circulated coins, there's still silver in there. Silver is very high at the moment. So yeah, there's there's good money sitting in that box. So let's let's find out what you've got and let's go find out what we can do with it. Well. I just want to leave you with a couple of things that condition is the main key to whatever we've got that is valuable to us. What condition is it in? How well has it been taken care of? Um, time is not always a friend to condition. Um, and that's just the nature of it is what it is. Um, but let's find out what it is and let's find out what we can do about it. Um, and it has been an absolute pleasure spending this time with you. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let Tracy know. And um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Tracy, right. have I we have got two anything? Questions, two questions so far. One person asked, what do you call the style of the bracelet on the Rolex watch? Well, that Rolex watch is what they call, quote unquote, the president, the presidential. 
I believe it was given to Eisenhower. Don't quote me on that. I'm a little rusty on my, my Rolex history, um, but it's it's got one large link in the middle and it's got the row of um, uh, gold links on the side. It's it's Rolex has got very specific looking bracelets for each of their styles. And this that one is a Rolex president that we looked at. Okay, next question. Someone just asked for fine jewelry, what is the best way to sell it knowing that you usually don't get what it's worth? Ooh, pull up a chair. We're gonna have a conversation here. Okay. Mm. Value depends on the marketplace that you're in. So you have to understand that. When you go to have your jewelry insured, that is retail replacement. Okay, this is very important terminology and you need to understand the difference. So if you, you call me and say, Amy, I've got, you know, all this jewelry and we need to get it insured for, we need to get it insured. And that's, that's the marketplace that we do insurance for retail replacement. Now, if we've got an estate, by IRS definition, and this practically tattooed inside of my brain because I have to do it so much, for, for estates, it is a fair market value, meaning a willing buyer and a willing seller, it is the price that they would agree on. And that is usually a secondary market. And the secondary market is a very different market than your retail replacement market. I usually do that my hand, I can't, it's hard to do this on Zoom. Um, I usually do it, it's, it's a very different marketplace um, and because it's a different value and it's a different, need for what it is. So when you say it's a different, it's lower than what it's valued at, it's different than if you needed to go out and repurchase it. Now, if you need to go and sell something, you're like, I just, I don't wear this. I'm not going to wear it. Let's find the best marketplace for it. And in order for me to, to tell you where the best marketplace is, I need to see it. And I need to see what it is because there are, there are like, there are so many different auction houses that have got different specialties. There are different estate dealers that have got different specialties. I've got estate dealers that deal in only Art Deco. I've got estate dealers that only deal in Victorian jewelry. I've got estate dealers that only deal in Georgian jewelry, which is even older. So everybody's got a different specialty and I want to be, and they will offer top dollar depending on what the condition is for what it is that you have. So in, it, it's not a blanket, oh, go down to Joe on the corner, he'll offer you. It's not, it's not always in your best interest. Some things need to go to auction. Some things um, an estate dealer will offer best on. Some things like a diamond, um, a, a, diamond, a diamond dealer will not deal with people in off the street, but they will deal with somebody like me. Um, so there's a lot, of different, a lot of different angles and a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, I'm happy to take a look and um, point you in whatever direction that I, that I can.